We've talked about on the show before the importance of being emotionally healthy and how that affects your spirituality because you're a three-part being. Your spirit man, your emotional man, and your body all relate to each other and interact with each other. Well, when we isolate and just put an emphasis on your spirit man, for example, in Christian circles, or we focus just on our spirituality and we neglect our emotional health or our physical health, we will still be a broken, fragmented human, right? Because you have a three-part existence. Well, I wanted to talk about today diving into emotionally unhealthy spirituality, which I actually want to talk about the top 10 symptoms of being emotionally unhealthy and how it affects your spirituality. These are 10 areas that we can actually look at to identify like, hey, am I emotionally healthy in this area or not? Because if we're not emotionally healthy in an area of our life, that actually does directly impact our spirituality in our journey with the Lord. Because the way you view the world through your mind, your will, and your emotions impacts the way you filter everything, including your spiritual experiences. And so we're going to dive into these top 10 symptoms of being emotionally unhealthy and how you can address those things to develop and nurture a very whole healthy version of yourself. Okay, let's dive in. Hi, you're listening to Java with Jen with your host, Jenna Lee Samuel. On this show, I bring the simplicity of hearing God's voice into everyday life in a no-nonsense, authentic, and super practical way. With coffee in hand and real life in our faces, let's do this. Did you know that I help people who want to become podcasters get started. It's true. It's a wonderful coaching program. I'm obsessed with my students. And one of the tools that I encourage them to use to make things easier is this app, Spotify for Podcasters. It used to be called Anchor, but I love it. I've been with them for years because it is literally all the tools in one place. You can create, edit, publish, and even monetize your show all in this one platform. And the best of all, it is actually totally free. Yes, you can download it today and get your show started. But if you'd like a little help in the process, just reach out to me. I can totally help you out. All right, let's get back to the show. Have you ever been in a situation where life was challenging, life was just really difficult, even downright painful, and you could tell you're like, I need help. I need help with this. I need to help figuring out how to navigate this. And you've reached out for help, but maybe the help that you received was actually not very helpful. Like I know that some marriages I've heard um, from women who their husbands are emotionally abusive and the advice that they've gotten is, well, you just need to submit more. You just need to give him more sex. You just need to placate to him or pacify him. And, And that advice is completely unhelpful because the root of the issue is him actually not walking in emotional health and her not having healthy boundaries, right? Um, or let's say you have uh, you're you're struggling and you're having all kinds of like mental struggles or emotional struggles because of a trauma you've gone through. Or let's say you have an anger problem and it's disrupting all of your relationships. And the advice that people look at you and give is, well, I'll be praying for you, or you just need to read your Bible more, or you just need to die to self more, or you just need to turn the other cheek and learn how to be more Christ-like, or all these other. Um, blanket phrases that are given that are actually not helping us deal with the root issue. And you can feel in your heart, like your heart is still screaming, or maybe even you know that things are unhealthy and you feel pain on the inside because you're in a difficult situation. And even in your own mind, you keep telling yourself, no, you just need to be more content in Christ, or you just need to Uh, die to yourself, lay down your life in love, or love pays the price. You know, all these different phrases we tell ourselves to try to force our heart into a better place when all the while your heart is screaming at you, something's not right. Have you been there? I've been there. If you've been a Christian for very long, you've probably been there at some point, right? Because it's actually pretty common. People mean well, and, and when we reach out for help, we don't always know exactly what help we need. We're just tr- we're we're hoping that someone can come along, see the issue we're dealing with and have the solution. And going to church and staying in the word of God is actually important. It actually really 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 is important because the alternate is the solutions of the world which are not always helpful and definitely don't always produce life. So, let me preface everything we cover in this episode with 
You need to stay in the word of God and you do need to stay in fellowship and community with believers. But alongside of that, dealing with our emotionally unhealthy areas is really, really essential. And I'm going to from the get-go, let you know some very practical things to do that is seek professional licensed counseling. Pastors are helpful and can be helpful, but if they are not professionally trained and you need a licensed counselor to really help you with your problem, if, the, if that pastor doesn't understand how the heart and mind actually work physically on a biological level, then sometimes limiting the counsel that you get to just a pastor can actually do more harm than good. And I say that as a pastor. (laughs) I think my greatest fear as a pastor is, is the reason my husband and I are very big on directing people to get professional counseling help is because we understand if we are not professionally trained in an area of mental health, and that is clearly what you need, we're going to do more harm than good by trying to just give you more scriptures when really you need some actual help rewiring your mind and your brain and healing from trauma. Okay, so that's all my prefaces. But in today's episode, we're going to dive into the 10 symptoms of unhealthy spirituality. And the reason why I call this unhealthy spirituality is because your emotional man interacts with your spiritual man. They actually are very, very integrated and woven together. You can't segment them. And that's what a lot of us have done in the church. And I say us because I've been totally guilty of it, where we will treat like I grew up kind of believing that my, my emotional man was the bad fleshy side of myself. And my spirit man was the good, sanctified, godly version of myself. And so I just needed to feed my spirit more and starve my soul, which I mean, if my soul is unhealthy and toxic, yeah, I need to I need to have less of the unhealthy toxic parts of myself and I need to feed the healthy parts of myself. However, when there are unhealthy broken places in your humanity, you actually need to get to the root issue and bring healing and correct wrong thinking to begin to move out of those spaces. Just starving or suffocating or shoving down or... Um, despising certain sides of yourself, that's not healthy. (laughs) God loves you. God made you a three-part being on purpose. God in his wisdom gave you a soul, gave you your emotions, your mind, your will. In fact, when our brains respond to trauma by putting up walls and guards, that's actually how God built our bodies because it's actually how we survive. Now, God has better ways for us than to live in survival, and he shows us how to do that, and that's part of getting emotionally healthy, is taking ourselves out of a space where we're just living in survival and putting ourselves back in a healthy space where we live at peace and from a place of of abundance in our hearts and minds. So you need to be able to, we need to be able to, to be healthy individuals, respect our full humanity. In Genesis God clearly made us in his image. He in, That includes our physical self, our spiritual self, our emotional self, our intellectual self, and our social dimensions. So all aspects of our humanity have been fundamentally made in God's image. So our journey isn't to despise certain aspects of ourselves. It is to figure out how to nurture those things into full godliness and into health so that we can be a healthy individual, not a fragmented individual. Ignoring any aspect of who we are as men and women who are made in God's image always results in destructive consequences. It destroys our relationship with God, with other people, and with ourselves. If you meet someone, for example, who's mentally or physically challenged, their their lack of physical or mental development may be readily apparent, right? Like maybe they, like physically you can tell, well, they can't do what the next person who's healthy could do. But sometimes when you encounter someone who is emotionally, they've ignored the emotional component of their humanity, um, it's not readily apparent that that is broken. However, as you engage in a relationship with that person, you begin to experience the sharp edges and the destructive patterns that they may still operate in. And we we all have this, okay? We all have a broken humanity. We all have broken human experiences because we've all brushed up against other people's brokenness, which has sometimes created brokenness inside of ourselves. Um, 
I want to tell you too, before I dive too far, I am pulling a lot of this from Peter Schizero's book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. This is the first chapter, and it is a wonderful book. If you're looking for something to kind of walk with yourself, like let's say we get through this and you're like, I think I need to tend to my emotional health as well. Um, this book is life because it is so well balanced. It honors the the godliness and the or the role of our spirit and our spiritual health and seeking the word of God and, and our relationship with God. But it also acknowledges the role that seeking emotional health plays. So Anyways, so he goes into diagnosing the top 10 symptoms of emotionally unhealthy spirituality. So, you know, just like if, if something's wrong inside of your body, for example, you'll have pain, you'll have maybe swelling, you'll have indicators that something is wrong below the surface, right? That's our body talking to us. Well, the same way, there are indicators or symptoms of when we are emotionally unhealthy as well. And so there are ways to recognize, hey... I need to tend to some things here. Um, and so here are, in short order, as he says, here are the top 10 symptoms of emotionally unhealthy spirituality. And we'll dive into each one of these. First one is using God to run from God. The second one is ignoring anger, sadness, and fear. Kind of like I mentioned earlier, if we just slap a Band-Aid, a spiritual Band-Aid on it. Ignoring anger, sadness, and fear instead of digging into it and understanding what's happening in our hearts. Dying to the wrong things. This I experienced in my life when I was in an abusive relationship. And I thought I just needed to keep dying to myself. And that if I had died to myself enough, it wouldn't hurt so bad. When that is wrong. Really, the relationship was toxic and ungodly. And I needed to draw some boundaries. Um, number four, denying the impact of the past on the present. So when we live in denial, you know, like the word of God says... Um, he who is in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Well, sometimes we misappropriate that scripture thinking that that means that literally all of my previous life doesn't affect me anymore because I'm a new being. Now you are a new spiritual being. God has made you totally transformed in your spirit. But your soul is still undergoing transformation. And so um, denying the impact of the past on the present is actually a sign of being emotionally unhealthy. Denying that the toxic family you grew up in uh, and how it impacts your current life, that is unhealthy. Okay, uh, number five, dividing your life into secular and sacred compartments. Kind of like I mentioned earlier, where we treat our spirit like it's the godly um, favorite child part of who we are and treating our soul like it's the ungodly fleshy um, part of us that we need to just suppress and tolerate that's wrong that's dividing your life into secular and sacred treating work as though it's just work and then church as though that's the holy side of you no 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 like your life is all an expression of of your spirit man and your the truth of who you are so dividing the two is unhealthy because it's actually not true. It's not how life actually operates. Um, number six, doing for God instead of being with God, performing for him rather than living in relationship with him. Number seven, spiritualizing away conflict. Oh my gosh. I've seen this a lot, especially as a pastor. It's very easy for people to be like, oh, that, like say you have a relationship falling apart. Oh, the devil's just coming after me and blah, blah, blah. And spiritualizing the conflict rather than dealing with the conflict. Number eight, covering over brokenness, weakness, and failure. Just pulling a blanket over it, ignoring it. Number nine, living without limits, without boundaries. That's unhealthy. Number 10, judging other people's spiritual journeys. These are all 10 symptoms of emotionally unhealthy people. Now, we're going to dive into this, and you're probably going to recognize yourself in some of these. That is okay. You are officially human and normal. <laughs> and so when you recognize yourself in these things, I want you to just begin to A, ask the Lord, like, Lord, how can I, how can I walk myself through this and out of this? But I would also encourage you, get this book, man. I mean, they did not, they're not paying me to market their book. I just love this book. It is life and there are so many practical tools. So if you recognize yourself in any of these things, I just want to encourage you to dig deep both with the Lord and in practical ways and say, how can we correct this? How can we get healthy in this space? Okay. All right. So let's dive into this first one. Using God to run from God. What does that even mean? I'm going to read what he has here. 
He says few killer viruses are more difficult to discern than this one. On the surface, all appears to be healthy and working well, but it's not. This virus hides behind our hours and hours spent reading one Christian book after another, engaging in endless Christian responsibilities outside the home. All that extra time devoted to prayer and Bible study. You might wonder how such things could be anything but good for the soul. Such Christian activities become detrimental when we use them in an unconscious attempt to escape pain. In my case, using God to run from God happens when I create a great deal of God activity in order to avoid difficult areas in my life that God wants to change. I know I'm in trouble when I do God's work to satisfy me and not him. I do things in God's name that he never asked me to do. I pray about God doing my will and not about me surrendering to his will. I demonstrate Christian behaviors so significant people will think well of me. I focus on certain theological points out of concern for my fears and unresolved emotional issues rather than out of concern for God's truth. I use biblical truth to judge and devalue others. I exaggerate my accomplishments for God to subtly compete with others. I make pronouncements like, the Lord told me I should do this, when the truth is, I think the Lord told me to do this. You, I use scripture to justify the sinful parts of my family relationships, cultural values, and national policies instead of evaluating them under God's lordship. I hide behind God talk or God language, deflecting the spotlight from my inner cracks, and I become defensive about my failures. Or I apply biblical truths selectively to avoid anything that would require making significant life changes. So the, the way I see this the most is when people, maybe they wear Christian language and they, but you can tell they're not being authentic. You know, they're like, oh, everything's great. God is so good and da, da, da. And there's always a, a God explanation for everything in their life. But it's like, you kind of look at them and you're like, can you just, can you just put down the facade real quick and let me see your real humanity real quick? Like, are you actually okay? <laughs> you know, that kind of experience. That's the whole running from God, or sorry, using God to run from God. Here's an example. John uses God to validate his strong opinions on issues ranging from the appropriate length of women's skirts in church to political candidates to gender roles in his inability to negotiate issues with fellow non-Christian non managers at work. He does not listen to or check out the innumerable assumptions he makes about others. He quickly jumps to conclusions. His friends, family, and coworkers find him an unsafe and condescending person. John then goes on to convince himself that he's doing God's work by misapplying selected verses of scripture. Of course that person hates me, he says to himself. All those who desire to be godly will suffer persecution. Ultimately, however... He's using God to run from God. So if there's an area in your life where you feel like, you know, maybe it's usually easier for us to recognize in other people's lives, but I want to encourage you to take an honest look at your own life. Do, are you quick to offer a God explanation for very practical things in life? You know, is God involved in our lives? Yes, absolutely. Can God be involved in everything in our life? Yeah, sure. Because our spirit man is a part of us and God's spirit lives in us. So, of course. But, you know, if, if, if you have a health crisis and you need to lose weight or I need to lose weight at, in order to get my life back under control and, like, not spiraling to death, then giving a God explanation for that isn't always relevant, you know? I mean, sure, is God involved? Yes, maybe God's giving you the wisdom and God has been speaking to you, hey, you need to get your health in line. That's not using God to run from God. Using God to run from God would be like, oh, it's okay, like um, God's grace is on me and, and God is going to extend my life because he has called me to life and not death, you know, and he just, his blessing is on me and he is d rebuking the devourer for my sake. You know, when you, when you almost use God to justify away and excuse away what should be healthy in your life, that's when you're using God to run from God. So if that's you, I encourage you to stop and and 
And just take the time to look below the surface and say, you know what? What am I running from? What am I afraid of? What do I need to give my attention to that I have been afraid to give my attention to? And that leads us into the second thing, which is probably connected. If you've been using God to run from God, and and when, when I you say run from God, that's because God always wants to deal with our heart. He wants to deal with the truth of who we are. He always deals in truth and he leads us. The Bible says that the spirit of God will lead us into all truth. That includes the truth of what's going on inside of your own heart and mind. And God does not, God himself does not use spiritual excuses and explanations to cover over and to distract from the real issues. God is the one who will come in and put his finger on the real issues and not allow us to just continue to make spiritual explanations. In fact, we saw that he did that throughout the word with the Pharisees. The Pharisees were real good about having spiritual explanations that glazed over the real issues and Jesus didn't allow them to do that. He would get right to the heart. Okay, so the second thing goes kind of goes into what am I hiding from? What am I running from? And so the second symptom of unhealthy spirituality is ignoring anger, sadness, and fear. A lot of times when we use God to run from God, it's because we're actually also running from and ignoring anger, sadness, and fear in our lives. Many Christians believe wholeheartedly that anger, sadness, and fear are sins to be avoided. And when we feel these emotions, we're sure it's an indication that something is wrong with our spiritual life. Anger is dangerous and unloving toward others. Sadness indicates a lack of faith in the promises of God. Depression surely reveals a life outside of the will of God and fear. The Bible is filled with commands to not be anxious about anything and do not fear. So what do we do? We inflate ourselves with a false confidence to make those feelings go away. We quote scripture, we pray scripture, we memorize scripture, anything to keep ourselves from being overwhelmed by these feelings. Like most Christians, Peter says, I was taught that almost all feelings are unreliable and not to be trusted. They go up and down and are the last thing that we should be attending to in our spiritual lives. It is true that some Christians live in the extreme of following their feelings in an unhealthy, unbiblical way. It is more common, however, to encounter Christians who do not believe that they have permission to admit their feelings or express them openly. This applies especially to difficult feelings like fear, sadness, shame, anger, hurt, and pain. And yet, how can we listen to what God is saying and evaluate what's going on inside when we cut ourselves off from our emotions? To feel is to be human. To minimize or deny what we feel is a distortion of what it means to be image bearers of God. To the degree that we are unable to express our emotions, hear this, we remain impaired in our ability to love God, others, and ourselves well. Let me say that again. To the degree that we are unable to express our emotions, we remain impaired or broken in our ability to love God, to love others, and love ourselves well. Why? Because our feelings are a component of what it means to be made in the image of God. To cut them out of our spirituality is to slice off an essential part of our humanity. To support what I mistakenly believed about God and my feelings, I misapplied the following illustration. So he has a picture of a train with the, uh, the engine, the cart, and then the caboose. And as the engine, he has facts. On the cart, he has faith. And the caboose is feelings. And so this means he was believing that his life should be lived, facts, faith, and then feelings. He thought his spiritual life should head down the tracks beginning with the engine called fact, which is what God said in scripture. If I felt angry, for example, I needed to start with the fact. What are you angry about, Pete? So this person lied to you and cheated you. God is on the throne. Jesus was lied to and cheated to. Stop the anger. <laughs> After considering the fact of God's truth, I then considered my faith. The issue of my will. Did I choose to place my faith in the fact of God's word? Or did I follow my feelings and my fleshly inclinations, which were not to be trusted? At the end of the train was the caboose. And what was to be trusted least? My feelings. 
Under no circumstances, Pete, should you rely on your feelings. The heart is sinful and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? Jeremiah 17, 9. This will only lead you astray into sin. Can you see how harsh this way of believing is? And yet so many Christians live here. I've lived there. When taken in its entirety, the practical implications of such an imbalanced and narrow belief system, as we will see later, is enormous. It's a devaluing and a repression of what it means to both be human and made in the image of God. Sadly, some of our misguided Christian beliefs and expectations have, as Thomas Merton writes, merely deadened our humanity instead of setting it free to develop richly in all of its capacities under the influence of grace. Ah, oh, sweet grace. When you bring grace back into the equation, it changes things. And so that's the second symptom of unhealthy spirituality, ignoring anger, sadness, and fear. Because our Christian beliefs should not deaden our humanity. They should set free our humanity to develop richly in all the ways God has made us under the influence of grace, not fear. And so ignoring those things is a symptom of being unhealthy spiritually. The third way that we can be unhealthy spiritually, emotionally unhealthy, is dying to the wrong things. Now, I'm going to I'm going to hit this third one and then we're going to wrap the episode for this week because this is kind of a lot of content. I don't want to go on too long. And so we're going to make a second and third part where we dive into the rest of these because I want to give it time for you to kind of think on it and I want to give some tools at the end for working through these things, okay? So the third thing is dying to the wrong things. As Arrhenius said many years, many centuries ago, the glory of God is a human being fully alive. Okay, I'm going to pause here. I read this book recently. It's by Brene Brown, and she's known for her TED Talk on vulnerability, which, by the way, is incredible. I encourage you. In fact, maybe I'll put the link in the show notes so you can go watch it if you'd like. But she breaks down the power of shame and vulnerability and how vulnerability is the um, antidote, if you will, to living in shame. But what I love about the book, I think it's called The Gifts of Imperfection. And she did some research where she studied a whole bunch of people and people that live wholehearted lives, like they, they live wholly alive. Their hearts are alive. They're vibrant. They're healthy individuals. And so it's the book is about the journey of wholehearted living. It is a really great book as well. And in it, she talks about the power of being a fully alive human and, and all the different aspects of what wholehearted living looks like. In fact, one of the chapters was about dance and how someone who, who dances and loves to dance and sing that is actually a symptom of being a wholehearted, alive person. And she actually a lot of times looks at the way children function because we come into the world wholly alive. Our, our souls haven't been broken by life's challenges yet. So children are actually a great example of what it means to live wholly alive. They're full of fun. They're full of vibrancy. They're full of grace and forgiveness and positivity. They love to dance and they're enthusiastic. And so it's just an incredible, incredible book. Um, but I, that's another book I would recommend. I'll put it in the show notes um, about what it is. The, but here, Irenaeus is saying the glory of God, the glory of God, which means it, it glorifies God and it shows off the godness inside of you when you are a human being who is fully alive. We cannot be fully alive if we are emotionally fragmented and broken and we tolerate it. Or worse, we slap Christian explanations on it to repress the broken places of us rather than dealing with and healing the broken places of us. So dying to the wrong things is a symptom of being unhealthy spiritually. True, Jesus did say, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. But when we apply this verse rigidly without qualification from the rest of scripture, it leads to a very opposite of what God intends. It narrows, in, or sorry, it results in a very narrow, faulty theology that says, the more miserable you are, the more you suffer, hmm, the more God loves you. Disregard your unique personhood. It has no place in God's kingdom. This is wrong, but that's what happens when we take one scripture and we apply it rigidly 
without considering the full context of the word of God. We are to die, he says, to the sinful parts of who we are, such as defensiveness, detachment from others, arrogance, stubbornness, hypocrisy, judgmentalism, a lack of vulnerability. These are things we can be born with also that maybe we inherited from our parents or are just natural bents in our personality. And so these are the things we're meant to die to, the things that harm our relationships, the things that make us unhealthy, as well as the more obvious sins like murder, stealing, bearing false witness. We, we should speak the truth, right? We're not called by God to die to the good parts of who we are. God never asked us to die to the healthy desires and pleasures of life, like friendship, joy, art, music, beauty, recreation, laughter, and nature. God plants desires in our hearts so that we'll nurture and enjoy them. Often these desires and passions are invitations from God, gifts from him. Yet somehow we feel guilty unwrapping these presents. Now look, listen, look big picture at this. The word of God also says that the spirit gives life, but the flesh brings forth only death. One, and the Bible also says, you know a tree by its fruit. So when I'm looking at what are the good things of me that I want to nurture, even if they're intrinsic to my humanity, and what are the bad things that I should be dying to? If you step back and you look at it and say, what is the fruit that will produce in my life? So let's say I'm living out in a lot of arrogance or like putting myself first. That is something I need to learn to die to because that will hurt my relationships. It will nurture in me ungodly character because I'll live selfishly. Whereas love, um, love seeks the needs, seeks to meet the needs of others, right? But the good things like music and how music makes me feel alive and brings me alive, so long as the lyrics are not, of course, destructive, horrible things, but, but loving music, loving to dance, loving friendships, those things produce in me a sense of comfort, a sense of reassurance and life and love. They lead me to the things that God has built in that are actually for our good, which is community and support and encouragement. He says, don't, fel don't forsake the fellowshipping with other believers. So my desire to have connection and have friendships is a God-given desire. That's a good thing. Can it become unhealthy? Yes. If I allow my friendships to replace meeting needs in my heart that God is meant to meet, um, like a sense of security and identity or confidence, my friendships are meant to enhance my life, not, um, not be integral to the happiness of my life, if that makes sense. So there's a fine line. And you guys will see that when we're talking about anything healthy, there's a ditch on both sides of the road. If you can go extreme in one direction or the other, and both extremes are unhealthy. Wisdom is found in the middle. You guys have heard me say this so many times. Wisdom is found in the middle because it requires that we know ourselves and that we're in touch with our hearts and our minds and our intentions in order to walk in the middle of the road. I have to know my heart to know if I'm pursuing friendships to an unhealthy degree or to a healthy degree. For example, let's say I'm going kind of far off on this, but I just want to make the illustration so you guys can follow me. <coughs> How do I know when a friendship is getting unhealthy? For example, friendship is a desire God's given us. Friendship is important in our life, but I've recognized when friendships have gotten unhealthy, if I felt if I said to myself, I don't know what I would do if I ever lost this friendship. I don't think I could go on. That's unhealthy. Not that I should be flippant about losing people, but we will lose people in life sometimes. And, and a healthy individual can go through the grieving process and recover. Or if someone moves off and I'm, I'm less in touch with them, it, shouldn't, it should not make my life fall apart. Or let's say my friend, who is my dear friend, develops another friendship outside of me. If I wrestle with jealousy and insecurity and I find myself grappling at that friendship, something in me is unhealthy, right? But if I can look at that friend and enjoy the fact that they're finding enjoyment in another friendship as well, then I'm healthy. Does that make sense? And so we have to know our hearts. We have to pay attention to what's happening on the inside to be able to recognize if we're in a healthy space in regard to anything in life that is good or not. When I ask people, tell me about your wishes, hopes, and dreams, they're often left speechless, Peter says. Why do you ask? They respond. Isn't my only wish, hope, and dream supposed to be to serve Jesus? Mm, not exactly. God never asks us to annihilate ourself. 
We are not to become non-persons when we, when we become Christians. The very opposite is true. God intends our deeper, truer self, which he created, to blossom as we follow him. God has endowed each of us with certain essential qualities that reflect and express him in a very unique way. In fact, an essential part of the sanctification process, becoming more like Jesus, is allowing the Holy Spirit to strip away the false constructs we've accumulated so our true selves in Christ can emerge. I created a reel the other day built on a quote that I had heard, which is so true and speaks to this, where it says, God will never violate who he has made you to be, but he won't hesitate to offend who you think that you are if it is not in alignment with who he calls you to be. And so God actually wants us, the more that you develop your relationship with the Lord and and learn to experience his love and how he sees you and how he loves you, it will cause the development of the uniqueness and the, the flourishing of your soul. In fact, I found that when I went to college, and I went to Bible school and I made it my goal and my pursuit. I said, Lord, I want to know how you love me. I want to love who you've made me to be. And I want, I want to experience your love. So it was my goal in my quiet time every day to encounter the Lord's love. And you know what I found developed in me? I found that my, the femininity of who I was as a female began to emerge in a beautiful way. I began to love being a female where Previous to that, I had almost not resented being a female, but I hated like overly girly stuff because it seemed so weak and so this and so that. But I found that as I let my guards down in my quiet times and I let the Lord love on me, this femininity and this confidence and this leadership, all of the gifts he's put inside of me began to emerge very naturally. And I began to discover who I was, and I began to love who I was in a healthy, whole way. Now, that did happen because I went and spent time with the Lord encountering Him, right? And the healthy side of it was, I didn't die. I wasn't forcing myself to die to the good parts of me. I wasn't like, now before that, I kind of was. I was like, generally, don't be so, so feminine and soft. That would, that was me trying to like suffocate the way God made me. God made me a beautiful woman to be feminine and have softness that is unique and different than the men around me, right? And it's not something I need to apologize for. It's how God made me and I can embrace it, right? And so, Falling in love with the Lord and allowing him to love on me did cause those things to emerge. Now, if I found that there was a part of me that was like stubbornly refusing change, like let's say I just couldn't embrace femininity, then having time with the Lord would deal with it to some degree. But I also needed to tend to my soul and do the deep inner work of like, generally, where is this belief coming from? What is your hang up? Like, why are you so resistant to growing in your femininity? Like, what is the barrier here that you're brushing up against? What lie are you believing that's causing you to reject how God has made you? And so that's where you do an inner work that is just even on a like knowing your heart, knowing yourself level and see how the spirit and the soul work together. My developing of my relationship with the Lord fed my spirit and it caused wrong thinking in my soul to begin to fall off. But there's also such a thing as doing a deep work and understanding what's going on in my heart, what's going on in my mind. It's connected to your spirit, but it also can be a different work than, than just a spiritual encounter. You know what I mean? There's, there's different ways to handle ourselves. And, um, even sometimes like my sister, uh, took up a new hobby of doing, uh, what's it called? Um, Star Wars, the laser swords or whatever. I don't remember what they're called right now. Uh, But it's like a class, lightsabers. It's a lightsaber class, which sounds crazy and hysterical. Um, But she was like, this is helping me with my trauma. Now it's it's a physical class, right? But it requires a lot of deep breath work. And I'm gonna do it this summer when I go, I'm excited. She said, it's a lot of physical work. It's a really good workout. And it requires a lot of deep breath work. Well, the thing about deep breath work is when people undergo trauma, they can tend to slow down their breathing and do shallow breathing, like real basic fear-based survival breathing. And that's a real symptom of someone who has buried trauma. Well, she's gone through some difficult things. And so she said, even doing the breath work 
was kind of surfacing emotions that live in a repressed space. And, and not only that, but fighting with the sword and having the control in the situation was empowering and made her feel powerful and less like a victim and more like someone who was powerful in her own life, in her own body. And so even that was a physical um, activity, but it touched on her emotions and then no doubt the Lord will use it to speak to her as well. And so you see your body, your soul, and your spirit are all interconnected, but doing different, putting our attention to different things, like putting our attention to a physical activity, developing a habit of running and exercising can be emotionally healing for people. And that's because God made us a three-part being. It's all connected. And so when we isolate just the spiritual aspect of who we are and neglect the physical and emotional we are nurturing in ourselves an unhealthy life and an unhealthy spirituality. And so that's the first three things. I'm going to recap them for you real fast. The first one was using God to run from God. And by, by basically having a Christian explanation for everything and ignoring what's truly going on in your heart. Um, number two, ignoring anger, sadness, and fear. Ignoring the hard feelings and thinking that they're bad rather than recognizing them as lights on the dashboard indicating, hey, there's something going on in the engine. Tend to the engine. <laughs> Tend to the heart, right? So we need to embrace and, and dig deep and understand our hearts rather than ignoring anger, sadness, and fear. We need to know where things are coming from. And the third one was dying to the wrong things. God never asked us to die to the healthy aspects of who we are or the good aspects of who we are. He just asked us to die to the things in our humanity that are destructive and harmful and unhealthy. And so I want to encourage you guys like this is we're going to dive in. There's still seven more. We're going to get them in the next episodes. And I hope this is insightful for you. If you guys want more, I encourage you to get the book. It's called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. I will put the link to this book and the other one I mentioned by Brene Brown in the show notes so you can go check those out. Um, they are not paying me. Those are not affiliate links. I literally, those books were just game-changing life changers for me. And so I want to give them as a, as a reference. But just understand this. You are a whole being. Your body, your soul, your spirit are all made in the image of God. Intrinsic to the fact that you're made in God's image, all three aspects of you are good. There is goodness built into every aspect of who you are, but life and the enemy and lies will come along and try to break down the goodness that is built into us. And so I want to encourage you, the areas in your life where you feel like things are, are broken, things are not working right, things are just not flourishing like they could, I want to encourage you to take time and like journal and ask yourself. In fact, one really great way to get to the root of unhealthy spirituality is to identify lies in our beliefs that are causing us to behave in certain ways. And so that's going to take us into our life hack. So don't go anywhere because I have a life hack for you right now. Okay, so here's your life hack. This is a really practical way. If you're like, hey, I recognize I do some of these things. One really, really, really effective way to get to the bottom of what's going on in your heart is look at the areas of your life where you feel like you, um, you're not flourishing. It's not as um, fruitful, life-giving as it could be. So I'll give an example um, of... I felt like for a while that my business was not being very fruitful, my marriage was not fruitful, and my weight loss efforts were not fruitful, all three of them. And so this was a hack that I learned um, from reading a book called, I think it was like the Success Habits of Millionaires or Millionaire Success Habits, I think is what the book was called. Anyways, they talked about the power of limiting beliefs that when we when we have beliefs that limit us, a lot of times they're subconscious and we don't actually recognize that it's a belief that we have until we recognize, until we, until we have the area of our life that's really unfruitful. Um, because a lot of beliefs come in subconsciously. So it's not even like a conscious thing that we're meditating on. It's just kind of went into our heart and just creates our function. So they said the way you can identify where you have a limiting belief is look at the part of your life that's unfruitful and ask yourself, what do I think about or how do I feel about business? For me, it was business, weight loss, and my marriage. 
And the three of them, I and they say, now don't edit and filter. Do not overthink. Just kind of let your heart talk to you and just let it bubble up. Um, the insight that you need is going to be, it has to be intuitive and natural because the problem is the reason a lot of us stay out of touch with our hearts is that we're so used to editing and um, filtering the way that we think. We actually don't let the truth of what's in our heart come up and come forward, right? So when you ask yourself this, don't edit it. Just let the first thing that comes to mind, come to mind. And so for me, and it was weird because I was like, that doesn't sound like me. Uh, the response that I had, I said, how do I feel about business? And, or what do, I, what do I think about business? For me, it works better at how do I feel. Some personalities are like, how do I think? Um, and so for me, the response was, ugh, so much work, so much torture and no reward. And I was like, oh, that's weird. And so I was like, well, how do I feel about marriage? And I had the same emotional experience on the inside. Ugh, so much work and no reward. And then I was like, how do I feel about weight loss? And I was like, oh, so much work and no reward. And I was like, okay, clearly there's a common thread here. But I thought about it and I was like, you know, why would I feel that way? Because I actually really, by nature, am a worker. I like to work. I like to achieve. I like to accomplish things. And I actually am fruitful in my life. Um, in when I put my hands to something, I figure it out, right? So I was like, that doesn't feel like it's my belief. And so I was like, where does that come from? And I just kind of asked my heart. I was like, heart, is this an inherited belief or is this my belief? And I just instinctively felt like this is an inherited belief. And so through prayer and some, some things, I was able to identify that that belief actually came from my dad and from his grandfather. And so I was like, hold on. I thought about it and I realized my grandfather was raising a family, a young family during the Great Depression. His grandfather, my great grandfather. And I realized that during the Great Depression, they probably had that experience, a whole lot of work and no reward. It was always a struggle. No matter how hard you worked, there just wasn't enough to go around. And so I was like, oh my gosh, this is an inherited belief from my great grandfather that probably just passed to my grandma, passed to my dad, passed to me. And so when I recognized, okay, this is an inherited belief. So whether it's inherited or whether it's mine, regardless, that was the belief in my heart. And so I then began to correct it. I began to, okay, I need to rewrite how my mind perceives work. And so I said out loud to myself, because your brain actually retains what you say out loud 80% more than just what you think. It, what comes out of your mouth, your brain processes as truth. And so when something just floats around in your mind, your brain doesn't necessarily engage with it as truth, but if it comes out your mouth, it does. So you need to say things out loud if you want to re reframe the way you think think. And so I said out loud to myself, you know what, Jenna Lee, that's an inherited belief that is not your belief and it doesn't have to be your belief. Instead, Jenna Lee, the word of God says, and you, you are a hard worker and the word of God says that your labors will be fruitful. And so Jenna Lee, everything you put your hands to will be fruitful and will prosper because you walk in the blessing of the Lord and you are smart and you are intelligent and you're going to put your hands to the things that will bear fruit. And so I began to rewrite the way that I thought in that area. And wouldn't you know, things started to shift in all three of those areas. Actually, now it's about a year later and my business is actually taking off. I have lost 14 pounds and I'm losing more weight. And my marriage is a lot healthier than it was even then. And so by addressing root limiting beliefs and correcting it with the truth, which Guys, this is a simple practice. This is what the word of God means when it says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so when we know our mind and identify the things that we're believing that may be limiting us and we replace it with the truth, you can begin to heal those areas of your life. That's one very practical tool that is both reinforced with scripture but is also a very practical practice that even counselors will tell you to do when you're trying to get healthier in an area. And so that is one way that you can rewrite limiting beliefs or subconscious beliefs or lies, whatever you want to call it, lies that you believe. Um, but whenever there's an area of your life that's not bearing fruit, 
God has built this world and built us to be fruitful. And so when something's not bearing fruit, something in the process is broken. And we have to figure out where is there a lie? Because when we walk in truth, life and truth are in the Lord, right? And so when we walk in truth, life will be a result. And so when we walk in truth in an area of our lives, it should be fruitful. And so that's just kind of one way to kind of almost like um, reverse engineer an area in your life. Look at the fruit and backtrack. Okay, what do I believe about this area? So the exercise was ask yourself, what do I feel about this area or about this thing? And the first emotion or thought that you have connected to that is the clue to or is your literal limiting belief. And so that is the lie that you want to then grab a hold of and say, okay, we need to rewrite this. And then you rewrite it by speaking out loud the truth to yourself, something that your heart can believe. Don't try to tell yourself something your heart can't embrace and believe because your heart needs to be be able to believe what you're rewriting with, okay? So I hope that was helpful as a little life hack for you. Um, Come back next week. We're going to jump into part two where we talk about the next three uh, areas or symptoms of emotionally unhealthy spirituality so that we can get ourselves in a place where we are emotionally whole individuals. All right, I'll see you guys next week. Also, don't forget, go follow me on Instagram at Java with Jen. Also, if you are wanting to start a podcast, I will be launching my second round of the podcast plan mastermind in August, probably probably August. Um, But I actually already have people that are interested that I'm building a list of people to be in touch with. If you want to start a podcast, I walk you through the whole process. It's going to be a 10 week process to get your show up and equip you with all the tools to grow and monetize your show. It was a wonderful experience. This first round with my students was incredible. They have some amazing shows. They are leaps and bounds ahead of where I was when I started. And so if you want to be a part of that, please reach out to me. You can email me at Java with Jen podcast at gmail.com, or you can leave me a message on Instagram as well. Okay, I'll see you guys next week. Thanks so much for tuning in to today's show. Listen, let's stay connected. Come follow me on Instagram at Java with Jen, where you can follow the latest and say, hey, it's a really great way to stay in touch. Many of you have also asked how you can support the show. You can make donations through the Anchor app or on Patreon, or of course, by sharing, rating, and reviewing on social media and iTunes as well. Your heartfelt feedback always reminds me why I do this. Also, don't miss our merch store where you can get super cool Java with Jen swag and coffee. Find it at javawithjenmerch.com. Until next time, remember, hearing God's voice is simple and he wants to be a part of your everyday life. See you next week.